Well, it's great to welcome Molly Brennan to MSU today. Molly is the 2023 Grand Marshal for homecoming at Michigan State University. Molly's a Spartan with both academic and athletic legacies. She was the engineering group manager for the truck and bus division of General Motors Corporation, where she won the first World Solar Challenge, setting four solar and electric land speed records in the Guinness Book of World Records, Spartans Will. Beyond her illustrious career in engineering, however, she also made significant achievements as a track athlete, scholar, and philanthropist. Molly, welcome and congratulations. Well, thank you. It's always good to get back to MSU. How does it feel? I mean, of, of all you've accomplished, yeah. I imagine Grand Marshal of Homecoming for your alma mater is kind of a cool oh one. Oh my gosh, yes. I would say totally unexpected. Um, and it's just, I, you know, when they contacted me, it was just a, a profound sense of honor and gratitude. You know, I just, I love MSU. Uh, the Grand Marshal stands in for everything that MS, that everything is good about Michigan State. And I just really, it's a, I'm very happy to have been selected and I hope I'm able to do it the justice that it deserves. Well, a, a little, before I ask you some more questions, a little bit of a lightning round uh -huh. to start. So favorite spot on campus? Oh, that's a toughie. Um, you know, I wasn't on campus a whole lot. We were always gone Thursday through Sunday with track meets. But, you know, I was driving down I was driving down here and I went by the bridge that was between the stadium and, and the library. The library and also for me the computer center. Yeah. Oh, and oh, I went over are. that so much for so many classes. <laughs> so I think I'd have to say that was probably my favorite spot. And of course, you know, when I was here it was the terms. That's right. Me so too. So yeah. when the flowers came out, when everything started budding. We were still here. We were unlike still here. now, yeah. Right. And it was just gorgeous. and it was gorgeous in fall. So yes. I guess I'd have to say that's probably my favorite okay. spot. Okay, and what about hardest class you took? Hardest class. I really didn't have a hard class. <laughs> and, and and the reason why is First of all, I only took classes that I loved. You know, with the yeah. honors class, with the honors college, I could waive prerequisites and take any class that I was interested in. I mean, I still had to meet my major. Of course, and stuff, but you know, when Andrew Young came to class, it was in poli sci, and he had a four hundred level class that brought in ambassadors, and I knew oh. nothing about that. But I was going to sit my fanny in one of those seats, and and with track, I knew I'd never have time to to study before tests. And before finals, we were always gone at nationals the week before finals. So my study or my homework was always, I had to understand it. And if you understand it, you remember it. So I took my time. So the classes were never hard for me. They were an enjoyment. I really enjoyed it. And I never struggled because I never put things off to the last minute. Favorite dairy store flavor? Oh, my God. Well, my, my favorite one is, and they always call it Buckeye, because it has a peanut Buckeye butter. Buckeye Blitz. Yes. I know. I, cannot, I agree. I, in good conscience, cannot take it. <laughs> I, know. So, I know. I can't. It's and, my favorite, and, but I can't say I it. I can't is. say it. And, and part of it is, you know, Mimi Rogers was the coach of Ohio State, and she she took a big, t she took a championship away from us. Ooh. And it came, you know, the race came down. It was usually Wisconsin and us, and the only way that Ohio State was going to win the Big Ten was if both of us were disqualified. And on the last lap, Pat, Pam Sedwick was running for us. I don't know if you remember that name, but she was uh, 800 runner and she was running, running the end. And Wisconsin came around and when they passed her, they tripped her. Oh. So she goes into the infield to pick up the baton and comes out where she went in and finished. Well, Mimi disqualified both of us. So on all counts, competitor, they were, they, they stole that one from, so I can't take my favorite ice cream. Well, then we'll go with the sesquicentennial, <laughs> sesquicentennial swirl, perhaps. That's yeah, another. if anything, if anything has caramel in it, if it has caramel and chocolate or fudge, I'm I sure will go for is, that. So, but, okay, what about, uh, you might have hinted at it earlier with the flowers, but favorite season on campus? Yes, yeah, so that's a tie. I love fall. Yeah. I think Michigan fall is by far the Agreed. best season. But for me, spring also is our big meets. It is a pleasure to train in, and we are competing. And I, I, I train to compete. I didn't train just to train. I'm not. I told my coach today I had to run a step further than the quarter miles when my running days ended, and I stuck with it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a tie between those two. I'm sorry, I'm not all no, that's a, <laughs> straight on them. What about when you were on campus? What dorm did you live in? Oh, I was in uh, Wonder South, third floor, okay. for two years. Okay. And then moved off because I was missing too many meals. You know, I had to be back in time for when the cafeteria yeah, closed. Right. 
but I loved I loved it. It was a great central spot. Great uh, ultimate frisbee free fri- <laughs> ultimate frisbee field next door. <laughs> yeah. All right. So Molly, now take me back and I assume you were probably recruited for athletics too. What yes. what attracted you to MSU and then how did it impact where you've gone? gone. Oh my God, that's a everything. Um so what attracted me? I, I was strong in academics. Um I knew I wanted to go into computers or in, in engineering. Um so it had to be strong in athletics, strong in academics. And then it was visits. And, you know, Michigan State had one of the best computer, you could do computer engine, computer science out of the College of Engineering. So you had both the hardware and software. Um, the Honors College, I just looked at and said, nobody else has it where you can follow your passion. And I don't think I could have done my, you know, double major without the Honors College. And it had that. But I think, I think the deciding one was when I stepped foot on campus and it felt like home. I don't know how else to describe it, but, you know, you start to walk through on your tour and it just, you know, they they gave enough time to pass. The people seemed very friendly and it felt like home and that just did it for me. Yeah. What about some, some favorite memories or, or funny stories? Did you ever bump into magic or, I did with magic. So the day you were named a Rhodes Scholar must've been a highlight. Although the Rhodes Scholar was over in Chicago, but it was because of MSU. But no, I did meet magic. Um, so I played basketball also in high school. So it was also Oakland County on that one. In fact, I think our women's track team could have given the basketball team a go. We had some good basketball players, too, because basketball was in the fall. And the men's team always practiced before us in Jenison. So I often would come early and watch them. And, you know, people say, oh, Magic can't shoot. It's all Kelser. And I say, oh, no, no, that man can shoot. He chooses not to. So when it became apparent to me that he wasn't going to be around, I grabbed one of those old, you know, those little... I don't know what you call those stick cameras. You know, back then it was real film. Yes. And it didn't have the, the flash on it. So it was really dark and grainy, but it was magic in myself. Yes. And I just said, I'm going to grab a picture with him. I love that man, you know. Um, Your first selfie. My first selfie, as, a, as it were, yes. So I think that would be one. But, you know, there are just so many so many positive memories and fun, a lot of fun memories of the track team. And yes. Well, talk about the Rhodes Scholar thing, though. I mean, yes. again, very cool. How did that come about and how was the experience? My favorite teacher was Lydia Woodruff. And she suggested to me that I might look at applying for Rhodes Scholar. And I thought, well, I don't have time for it. And God, you know, those people have to walk on water. That's not me. I'm too normal. <laughs> I'm a normal person. Um, but I did. I applied for it. And, you know, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a harder, maybe when you said something that was difficult, that was difficult for me. Because it's an involved, it's not that involved, but it's a personal statement. And what do you, how do you condense your life down to, you know, I forget if it was a thousand or fifteen hundred words, and enough so that they also understand who you are and want to meet you. So yeah. there were a lot of iterations on that, and then it was an interview on campus, and then it's a whirlwind. So you get a phone call, and they say that you're a finalist, uh, or I'm sorry, you have to go to the state. So I had to go. Our state interview was in Ann Arbor. And then I was selected there, and two days later I had to be in Chicago. And that was the, f- the, the final yeah. one. And it just goes as a blur. And I, j- I just remember wanting to race home to get back with people that I, I really can't fully enjoy something until I am able to experience it with the people that I love. So I remember hopping into a taxi afterwards and just rushing to the airport so I could get that flight home yeah. so I could enjoy it with, with my family. Is there something you're most proud of throughout your, your life and career? You know, it's, yes. Um, and, 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 and it's a sweet, sweet sad. Um, I love my career. And I was doing very well in General Motors. And I had Eamon, my first child, when I was 35. And then 36, I had Sean. And at that time, I was responsible for all of our electrical wiring and components on all of our trucks in North America. So I was long hours flying Canada, U.S., Mexico. And I just came to the realization I couldn't do both well. My husband had given his country up. He's from Canada to come down here. And he was in uh, medical residency. And as a result, if anything happened, it was my shoulders. And work gives you deadlines. Um, kids don't give you, I mean, they, there are deadlines, but they don't give them to you. And I, my humanities education said, I can't goof them up. 
So I made the very hard decision to stay home with my kids. And as a result, I think my kids are my proudest. Wow. My mom would say to me, great my mom would say to me, um, Molly, your greatest masterpiece is your kids. And I used to poo-poo it. But you know what? They're 27 and 26 now, and they're such fine individuals. Yes, I love that. And of course, I I got them both to come home (laughs) to here at Michigan State. And that was a tough one to get both. Sean was a shoe in But, you know, Eamon was, well, it was University of Chicago. It was, I forget which one out in California. But MSU won them both over. Well, and maybe it's related, but what about a challenge you've had to overcome in life to get where you are? Challenge? I would say the biggest challenge was being female. I never felt it because I never assumed that doors were closed to me because of it. But I had, so for instance, in junior high, they announced basketball tryouts. I had played on the girls' team in elementary school. There were no sports for girls. I showed up. I didn't question it. I, don't, I didn't consider it a challenge at the time because I was good. I could start. <laughs> um, and that got me into track, and I was, again, the only girl. Uh, ninth grade, uh, I was the fastest of all but two boys in Oakland County, but I couldn't compete at state unless there was a girls team. So the challenge then became, now I'm beginning to feel it because now I can't, I was able to do everything I wanted to do before, but but now I can't. And my mom called every board member and they say, oh, there's not an interest. And my mom would say, well, how do you know if, you know, if you don't have a team? And luckily she convinced one board member to take the cause. They got a team. There was many girls came out as boys and I've won state, and as a result, got my scholarship and came here to Michigan State, and the rest is history. So I think that was probably the biggest challenge. I didn't know, I didn't realize it at the time. And I think the other one might be, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my career, what I was going to major in. And I thought, well, math, and I really didn't get much help from counseling as well. You could be a nurse, you could be a teacher type of thing, right? And my dad brought home a book that was what you do with different degrees, and I read through math. I go, oh, God, that's not my, that's not my <laughs> career. <laughs> you know, it's too much at the desk. And when I read engineering, a spark went off. And I said, that's, that's my career. And I think that could have been a challenge because people kind of dismissed, because of my gender, what things I'd be interested in. And it could have been a challenge for me had I dismissed engineering and computer engineering. I was often the only girl in the class. Didn't feel it was a challenge. I was treated like everybody else. But in retrospect, those things could have been huge misses. What advice would you give for young women who want to enter the STEM industry? Please do. (laughs) You know, it's a marvelous field. And I happen to think that, I do think there are differences between men and women. And I don't know if it's culture. I haven't come to the determination, you know, is it biological or is it social? I really don't know that answer. But the the female engineers that I had working for me, They tended to be more team. If you saw a presentation, it's, well, we did this. Whereas many, not all, I'm going to be very, you know, generalization. Uh, But I think women are taught more to look broadly in general. Uh, Some of my best engineers were also men, so I'm not saying that men don't have that. But I would thoroughly encourage them. You know, if they have a, whatever you have a passion for, you do. And I don't care what it is. So I'd say to women, STEMs are marvelous careers. And what drew you to solar car racing in the first place? (laughs) Okay, that came apart at at, uh, the best time (laughs) in my life. So I love to compete. And when I'm driving, I got to be careful because if there's a car in front of me, I want to pass it. And I was back in the United States and I wasn't doing anything in sports. And my boss comes in and says to me, I was working at Chevrolet Engineering. And my boss, who also was a race car driver, by the way, comes in and says, we want you to drive a solar car in Australia. And I thought, yeah, right. They're trying to see how gullible I am because I am a gullible person. But he was serious. I thought, this is perfect. And he said, it combines all elements. You are you the ultimate team player from sports. I understand team. I'm an engineer. Even though the design of the Sunracer had been done, we were starting to get into the durability testing and also into the into the driving. And then General Motors mostly got involved in that race because they thought they were going to have a shortage of engineers. And they wanted an ambassador to go back out to the schools afterwards. And that would bring my humanities in. So it brought my engineering humanities, my athletics all together into one package. So I I won't say I backed into it, but I didn't go and seek it out. It fell in my lap, and what a gift. 
And what does it feel like to be in the Guinness Book of World Records? Oh, and... it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, and it's it's fun because, and here's a circle around. Yeah. Um, I was volunteering in the library at my kids' elementary school. They went through the public schools. So we were in Farmington Hills. And some kids came up to my son with the, with an older Guinness Book of World Records and had my name in it. Now, they knew my last name because I kept Brennan. I didn't go by Devlin. But, I mean, my kids, oh, my gosh. my Kids never think their parents do anything, right? Right, right. <laughs> So the process was fun, and it's a, uh, it's 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 a nice tip. It's nowhere near the honor, though, of being the Grand Marshal. I mean, to me, that yeah. is a distinction. Um, for the Guinness Book of World Records, it's it's a nice. Yeah. Well, Molly, a little bit more about what you did at General Motors, and mm-hmm. and because of your interest in solar, did you see this whole EV thing coming way back? When did when did that sort of so start you- saying, you know? Yes, but 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 as a far out, you yeah. know, we we knew that what we were doing was not going to be directly applicable. I mean, so we could go almost depending on the weather and the track and stuff like that. We could go almost fifty five, sixty miles an okay. hour with the wattage of a hair dryer. So, I think the idea of the electric car. There were other things that had to happen. Yeah. We had you know we had gallium arsenide. Uh, and silicon solar cells that back then it was, I think, 11 and 18 respective percent efficiency. We had a very expensive battery that you would not put into a car. Yeah. And we didn't have today, we you know where the batteries now can more, it's not like your big grid, it can mold. Um, but what we knew was that just like Kennedy and sparking the space exploration, we hopefully sparked an interest in kids. And that next generation would be the one that then would bring it to fruition. Again, a lot of things had to come together. But we also learned the trade-offs. You know, you had to be extremely efficient. You know, the aerodynamics was big. Energy management was big. So you had so General Motors would continue working on technology. General Motors really does a lot with technology, even though it doesn't yeah. go straight on the car. But it's there and put on the shelf and then expanded on until there is an... It's, economies of scale or price or something comes down where now it is applicable to go. So yeah. I think it I think it sparked the imagination to begin to let the automotive world start to think maybe we should do electric. Okay. Well, and now that they are diving headlong into that, mm-hmm. just what do you see as both sort of the challenges and opportunities? Where is all this heading, you know? Well, I hope we get it right because our planet is burning. You know, we have not, my generation has not been good stewards of our planet. No. So I'm hoping that it makes all of us take a look at everything that we do in our life and is it sustainable? You know, we're, we're polluting our waterways with agricultural runoff. There's, I mean, you look anywhere and there are opportunities. So I, I hope that, I don't know if ultimately, I mean, they've also dabbled with hydrogen as yeah. a f- fuel source for cars. And of course, electric is not always a panacea. It depends on where you're getting your electricity exactly. from, right? Right. Um, and it's got to be stable. I mean, people, as people have shown, you know, for two cents cheaper, they're going to go on the internet or go someplace else. So human nature is such that most people are not going to pay an inconvenience of either money, time, or having to have two cars. Um, so we've we've got to get. I, and also, engineers are great at if you can get the foot in the door. Engineers can always find a way to make something better. And it's incremental. But at some point, you cross that line then where now it is cheaper or whatever. So I think we're at that point now where it's feasible, it's economical, and we're only going to get better from there. Engineers are problem solvers. Totally. My husband can't stand it because you're standing in line in some place and you're always saying, you know, well, if they did this, this line would go faster. We wouldn't have this line. And he doesn't realize that that's, the way That's how your mind works. Are yeah, right. I'm not complaining. Why are they doing this? This I'm way. not complaining. It's just your mind notices You're these You're solving things. problems. Right? <laughs> You're absolutely right. Molly, uh, you know, and I encourage people to Google Molly because we can't oh. touch on all the cool <laughs> things she's done, but you have made a global impact in academics, yeah. sustainability, engineering, athletic scholarship. What fuels your passion in these areas and keeps you going now? I love all of them. I I guess it's a passion. And if you have a passion that fuels you, you don't feel like you need to be replenished. I love MSU. And I totally understand the transformative opportunities it gave me. And I want to give students here that same opportunity. So I think that fuels me to continue. You know, am I still doing academics? No, but I still am contributing. I'm, I'm here today even, you know, interviewing the kids for the 
for the overseas scholarships, and I'll be there to help them yeah. if they get, you know, they get the the interview. Uh, my husband and I have been fueling um, some scholarships. You know, we don't want kids to have to worry about working if they if it detracts from their ability to focus on education. So I think the passion is just that. If you have the passion, it fuels it. And yeah. I don't know exactly where the passion comes from. You just feel it. Yeah, yeah. And I want to make sure listeners know, Molly, that you've been working with the MSU Alumni Office to identify campus fund initiatives for homecoming that are meaningful to you and have transformed your life while on campus. One of the great things about MSU is Spartans can give back to the areas they are most passionate about. And to learn more about Molly's selected giving initiatives, visit givingto.msu. Dot edu slash homecoming giving to dot msu dot edu slash homecoming and molly great talking with you just summarize again your feelings you're the 2023 yeah. homecoming <laughs> grand marshal for your alma mater michigan state how's it feel what are you looking forward to you, so i i just have a big big smile on my face as i said it is an immense honor also to follow coach bibbs you know, Coach Bibbs, I can't speak more. I, I'm, I, he is such a phenomenal individual, so I'm humbled to be following him. I just hope that I'm able to share my spirit of come back. I know it's, it's come back as a theme, but I keep thinking of come back home because it is home. And I'm hoping that um, as Grand Marshal, I'm able to unite our student body, our faculty, especially our alumni, to reconnect back with Michigan State. Uh, hopefully they feel that immense sense of gratitude that I do. And if I can try to share that with them, maybe it'll inspire them to give back to MSU if they're an alumni. And if they're a student, to please take a full advantage, max out MSU. Do what you can to max out what it has to offer offer you because it has an awful lot. And hopefully to be transformative to them as it has been to me. Molly, so great talking with you today. Thanks for joining us on MSU Today. Thank you. That's Molly Brennan, Michigan State University's 2023 Homecoming Grand Marshal. Much more at homecoming.msu.edu. And I'm Russ White. This is MSU Today.